recorded approximately 2,700 years ago. Now see, in some people's mind, that would mean, well, why are we even paying attention to it today? That's old. We have a fascination with new. If somebody wants to sell something to the public, which word do they put on it? New. new. I mean, how many, of, how many companies put out a product and they say the same old thing. <laughs> Can I ask you, what do we want to see come up every morning? Sun. Something totally new or the same old sun? I want to see the same old sun. If you got up in the morning and you looked up at the sun and suddenly it looked just totally different, what would you be? You'd be scared, okay? Some things we need to know are reliable. Some things that we need to know. In fact, truth is old. Truth is reliable. Truth is something that you can count on. And what we have to understand when we come to the book of Isaiah, a book 2,700 years old, is that this is part of God's revelation that he has been developing from the very beginning. God has been revealing himself from the very beginning. And this is a process that he has interwoven, and this is part of how we know that this is from God, because God used such an amazing process to reveal his word. Isaiah revealed in chapter 1. We looked at the fact that he said, come, let us reason together. God is reasonable. God is reasonable. He, he talks to us and he reveals himself in a way that is reasonable. I've shared with you before, many people think that the Bible teaches we need to have blind faith. That's not true. We need to have a faith that is, has what, eyes wide open and we look at what God has done and we see that he has revealed himself in such a way that we can know it's from God. We can know when we read the, the book of Isaiah that this is God's revelation because he spoke things 700 years before the time of Christ and they were fulfilled in Jesus. He spoke things that were true then and they're still true today. And what we see in this chapter, now I, I'm going to just tell you, I'm not going to take this chapter verse by verse and try to, to dissect every little thing that it says. We're going to look once again in, a, in an overview of what this says, and we're going to see some basic principles that we see over and over in Scripture, and one that we'll see over and over in the book of Isaiah, but I want us to understand that this is God's revelation of truths that were true 2,700 years ago and they're true today in 2016. And they will be true regardless of how long our world continues. Look at verse 1. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem now it will come about that in the last days, 
the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war Isaiah said some things that would be really pleasant to see happen right now. Wouldn't you just love for the nations to take all of our weapons and melt them down and turn them into farming utensils? Would Rick love that? I, Rick would love that. <laughs> Make tractors, bigger tractors. Tra he was telling me about the air conditioning he has on his tractor, and I was just jealous. But the thing is, I mean, I love the fact that we live in a valley that feeds people all around the world and it drives me crazy that some of the people who have authority and power in our government don't recognize the importance of growing food and feeding people. Things that are peaceful, things that meet people's needs. And you read this passage and that last verse about hammering their swords into plowshares and it says, and never again will they learn war. There's even a love song. I ain't going to study war no more. You've heard that song before. That is a thought that captures the, the human imagination. And wouldn't it just be wonderful if the nations could live at peace and we could focus on things like raising food and feeding everybody? I mean, I'm told that the world has plenty of food to feed the entire population. And we'll get truckloads and then plane loads of food and we'll send them to another country. And corrupt politicians will steal it and use it for their own, uh, their own wealth. And it just seems that there is a corruption in human, humankind, humanity, that we cannot seem to focus on doing good. But there's coming a day. There is coming a day. I'm going to pause for just a second and share something very personal about myself. My wife is a teacher. And I grew up just like you grew up. You work for nine months, you take home the books, you do homework, and then June comes around and it's what? It's, I heard the word over here. Vacation. Everybody say vacation. 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 When vacation comes... I get all excited. I, I look forward to it. I, I anticipate it. And then my wife works her last day, and she's on vacation, and I realize, I'm not on vacation. <laughs> I mean, everybody should get at least a couple months off in the summer, right? You know, the, the thing is, vacation is something that we, we look forward to. I'll just be honest. I look forward to it, okay? I, I've heard people brag about the fact that I haven't taken vacation in 20 years. And I just think, why? Why? And I know, I understand. Sometimes you can't do the kinds of things on vacation. Sometimes you can't get away from work. But the thing is, if you can, if you can spend some time resting, if you can spend some time with your family, if you can spend time just focusing on your loving relationships, that's a good thing. But it's also kind of fun to go somewhere. And one of the places that I love to go is to the mountains. And I read this I chapter. It's a Disneyland. <laughs> well, I like that too, but it doesn't fit into the sermon. <laughs> I read this this week, and it says, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And I don't know, that's just one of the places that I love to go. I, we, I, most of you, but our guests don't know that I work during the week as a hospice chaplain, and I visit folks that that are ill and we sing some of the hymns we sing here and we share scripture together and I pray with them 
And we happen to have some uh, patients up in Oakhurst. And every time I get to go visit them, I kind of feel like I'm on a little vacation. I just love to drive up in the mountains, get out of town, and, and see the beauty of the mountains. Now, I know that's not exactly what this is talking about, but the thing is that as I read, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. That is a description of something that would be an awesome thing to do. Let's just think about it for just a second. What if God himself, we could look on a map and we could see the actual location that God himself was sitting on a throne and we could travel there and go and look at him and hear what he has to say and talk to him and maybe even embrace him. Can I just see the hands of those who would like to participate? Would that be awesome or what? Would that be exciting or what? The idea, I mean, that would go beyond anything I could plan for a vacation. If we could just go and we could see the Lord and he would actually be completely in charge of everything. We're coming up to an election and maybe you're not that excited about your options. What if it were possible to have God physically in charge of the government of the world. Right on. That would be exciting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Can I just tell you something? There's a day coming when that's going to happen. That is going to happen. That's what this chapter is about. This story, this description, this is a prophecy. This is something that God has promised will happen and the day is coming. Now, it says, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Gary Gibson, uh, at the last men's breakfast, he shared a little bit about he and Ann's trip to the Holy Land. And he had a little bag of rocks. He, he'd bring out a rock and say, this one came from this place. And he'd bring out another one and say, this one came from this place. And you can actually go and you can climb up the mountain where the temple used to be. And he said, when it talks about the mountain of the Lord, it's really true. Because to go to where the temple mount is, you have to climb. You just keep climbing and climbing. Because God actually literally put it on a mountain. And you can go there, but God isn't there right now. Now, he's there in terms of his omnipresence and so on. But he's not sitting on the throne there yet. But the Bible says that he will. And what I want you to notice as we outline this chapter, I'm just going to give you four very simple points. And the very first one is the mountain of the Lord, El Monte del Señor. And I'm just going to ask you, please forgive my, my poor Spanish. I try to, I do a little translation on the computer and I, I didn't get it done in time for Diana to check it for me. She checks it and, and I have pronounced it the best I can. But... The thing is, the mountain of the Lord is the theme of these first four verses. And there is, I want to just share with you, there is more in the future than just die and go to heaven. A lot of people think if you trust in Jesus, someday we just die and go to heaven. And it's kind of, that's the end of it. Now that sounds exciting. I mean, heaven is a wonderful place. And... I just am here to tell you, though, that the Bible tells us there's more to it than that. God has revealed a lot about the future that a lot of times we don't even think about. And I want to share just a little bit about that. If you have trusted in Jesus, if you have put your faith in Christ, you have a lot to look forward to in your future. As he talks about the mountain of the Lord, he says, there is more in the future than just die and go to heaven. Hay más en el futuro que solo morir a ir al cielo. There is a time called the millennium. How many of you have heard that term? The millennium. And to use another phrase, the millennial reign of Christ. The millennium is what Isaiah is talking about. He doesn't identify it here, but when you bring it together with the other prophecies of the Bible, we understand that what he's describing here, 
Christ or God Himself sitting on the throne on the Mount of God is a description of the millennial reign of Christ. Thank you. All of a sudden, the light has gone. During the millennium, Christ will physically reign on the earth. Durante el millennio, Cristo reinará fisicamente en la tierra. And the scripture says that during that time, it will be a time of peace because Jesus will actually reign. Now, here in Isaiah, it talks about God reigning on the throne in Jerusalem. In the New Testament, it reveals the fact that Jesus will reign during the millennium. Can I just ask you, who is Jesus? God. <laughs> he is God the Son. One of the things that the Scripture teaches, and many of you are very familiar with this, but the Bible teaches what we call the Trinity, that there is one God, and yet the Bible identifies the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're somehow distinct from one another, and yet all three are identified as God, but that brings us back to the very first teaching, there's only one God. How can there be just one God, and yet Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God, and Jesus said when he was in the world, he said, I and the Father are one. How can that be? How can three be one? Well, we don't fully understand that. This sermon isn't on the Trinity, and I'm not going to try to break that all down, but let me just say, God is beyond our understanding. And when the Bible says that God will reign and then it tells us Christ will reign, that's not a problem because Christ is God the eternal Son. He is God come in the flesh to give His life on the cross for us. And when the Bible talks about the mountain of the Lord, it tells us that during the millennium, Christ will physically reign. It tells us to look forward to that, to anticipate it. And as Isaiah was prophesying here, remember, he was prophesying to the nation of Judah. This is in the Old Testament. As I said, it's 700 years before the time of Christ. He's preaching to the nation of Judah, this nation that had followed God, but they had strayed away from, the, from God. And so Isaiah tells them, there's coming a time when God is going to reign on the earth. And so because of that, he encourages them, and this is the second point in your outline, he gives them a call to repentance. Yamada al arrepentimiento. And also a warning against sinful influences. Advertencia de la influencia del pecado. Let me read it from verse 5 to verse 11. Come house of Jacob and let us walk in the light of the Lord. That would be a good memorization verse, wouldn't it? Listen to it again. Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east, and they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. Their land has also been filled with silver and gold, and there is no need, no end, to their treasures. Their land has also been filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hands, that which their fingers have made. So the common man has been humbled, and the man of importance has been abased. But do not forgive them. Enter the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of His majesty. The proud look of man will be abased, and the loftiness of man will be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isaiah says there is coming a day when God will reign. And because of that, you need to repent. Because of that, you need to come back to the Lord. He says the nation has abandoned the Lord. We looked at that last week. This is a theme we're going to see over and over because Isaiah was living during a time that people had left the Lord. We are living during a time that people have left the Lord. And he says to them, you've allowed 
other people to influence you. Instead of following, walking in the light of the Lord, he says, come on, let's walk in the light of the Lord. But instead of that, you've been listening to other people. You've been listening, allowing yourself to be influenced by those who do not serve God. And that is a condition that's always been in the world. That is a condition that has always been among the nations. We, we've never, as in the whole time of since creation, we've never had a time where all the nations were following the Lord. And that's why when the scripture says there's coming a time that they will, that's such good news. Because there has always been sin in the world. But whenever you see a call to repentance and a warning of sinful influences, what needs to be our response? We need to point at everybody else. We need to talk about, aren't they awful? Anytime that the Bible warns to repent, we need to examine our own hearts. Now last week we had the Lord's Supper and we talked about the fact that the Lord's Supper is a time to examine our hearts and to come to the table of the Lord in a, in a, a manner that's worthy. But when, how often do you need to examine your heart? If I, if I just came around to each one of us and, and said, listen, let's just be honest. Let's be honest. How often do you need to examine your heart? Constantly. Constantly. If there is anything that I know about human beings, one of which I am, we are easily deceived. We are easily deceived. And sometimes, frankly, it's our own heart that deceives us. We are easily influenced. There are whole industries built on the fact that human beings are easily influenced. We're influenced to think that we can't live without something that really doesn't add anything to our lives at all. We're, we're influenced to be afraid of things that actually we need. We're influenced to trust in people that are not really that trustworthy. We are influenced to invest our money in things that will not benefit us at all. We're easily influenced. <coughs> And we're influenced to think and feel ways that are not appropriate. And we need to be influenced by the leadership of God. And in order to do that, we have to constantly examine ourselves and hold ourselves up to the light of what? God's word. Because God's word reveals God's truth. And so Isaiah, the words that he says to the nation of Judah absolutely apply in the 21st century to you and me and to the nation of the United States and to really if I could be preaching this message in any nation and it would be absolutely appropriate because we continually need to repent when we get influenced by others to walk in a way that is not appropriate to following God and he gives us a further warning in verses 12 to 21 it says for the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning. What is reckoning? Well, I reckon. What does that mean? Judgment. Okay. It's a judgment and reckoning is to take something and compare it to a standard. I don't know if I've ever shared this before, but my father-in-law, who this Saturday we're going to be having a memorial service in Colorado for my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. But my father-in-law was a calibrations technician. And the first time I ever heard that, I asked Andy, what's a calibrations technician? And what my father-in-law would do is he would travel around to different military bases and he would adjust all of their instruments. He would adjust their scales, he would adjust their I, I don't even know what all instruments there were. All I know is that all of the instruments that were used on the military bases, in order for them to work properly, they had to be calibrated. They had to be checked. This is something that my uncle did with scales. My uncle worked for years in a scale shop. 
And he didn't just sell scales, he went and he would check scales. I shared with you a couple of years ago that I discovered that my scales at home was 20 pounds off. Good or bad? It didn't work in my favor. <laughs> I used to think you bought a scales and as long as they work, they were fine. No! If they get off at all, you can be tricked. I thought, I'm doing fine, I'm doing fine. And all of a sudden, one day I realized I'm 20 pounds heavier than what I thought I was. <laughs> Things need to be set so that they're measuring properly. And so there has to be a standard. And so my father-in-law, he would travel around and he carried with him. It's kind of like a piano tuner. What does a piano tuner use? How many of you know? A tuning fork. And he hits it on his knee and he listens to the tone and he compares the, the strings in your piano because the fact is, anything with strings, I periodically have to tune my strings because just because you tune them once doesn't mean they stay in tune. We get out of tune! We get out of tune! We get uncalibrated. Our scales go off and we think we're doing fine, but unless we come back to the standard and measure our lives according to the standard, we'll find that we've gone off in a direction thinking that everything was right, when in fact we were misguided. We were misguided. And so we're told in the scripture a day of reckoning is coming. We have a tendency to want to compare ourselves to our neighbor. And you know, compared to that person, I'm doing fine. But the scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of what their neighbor is doing. Yes? No. no. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who is the standard? God is the standard. That's why the very first commandment in the Ten Commandments is love the Lord your God. We're to look to Him. We're to have no other gods before Him. We're to consistently come back to Him as the standard. And one of these days, one of these days, God is going to take our life and set it against the standard. And there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of determining how do you measure up? How do the weights of your scale measure? And if you were to measure yourself against God, how many of us think that we would have a chance at all? No, we wouldn't have a chance. Let's just understand that. And this is what God is saying. There's coming a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up that he may be abased. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up against all the oaks of Bashan. Now he's using descriptions of things that they would say in their country that made them great. He says, against all the holy mountains, against the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft, the pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks, and in the holes of the ground, behold the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts uh, of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. So the third point in your outline is judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Eloisio viene. And someone could say, well, well, how long is it supposed to be? Because the Bible's been saying, we've already said, this was 2,700 years ago. The Bible warns over and over, and it's actually a cliche, it's a, it's a joke. I'm sure you've seen at some point in your life, I've seen a hundred of them, if I've seen one. Some cartoon of a guy wearing a little sandwich board that saying the end is near or judgment is coming or some way saying that. And the world scoffs at that idea. But the Bible warns us that judgment is coming. 
How long? Quanto tiempo? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I take it back. I do know. At the end of every life, we looked at Hebrews 9, 27 last week. It said, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Last week I said it, I'll say it again. Every single one of us has an appointment that we will keep. I've missed some appointments. I tried really hard. It's so embarrassing. I've missed a couple of appointments. I hate that. I've been late for a couple of appointments. I don't like to keep other people waiting because I don't like them to keep me waiting. But there's one appointment nobody here is going to miss. There's one appointment nobody's going to be late for. We're going to die, and then we're going to stand before the Lord. Unless Jesus comes first. And if we have trusted him, we'll be taken, and we will be with the Lord. And we looked last week at the fact that there are two kinds of judgments. For a Christian, there is a judgment of what we've done for our reward. For a person who has not put their faith in Christ, they will stand before God and they will endure the judgment that Romans 3.23 talks about. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There will be an abasement like what it's talking about here. Did you notice as we went through this passage, he named all the things that Judah, that nation that he was speaking to, all the different things that they might claim. But look at us. We're great. We've done this. Jesus did the same thing. He said that one day there were, would be people who would actually say to him, but Lord, we healed the sick in your name. We did this. We did that. It's incredible to think of somebody that actually healed the sick in Jesus' name, and Jesus would say to them, I never knew you, but the point is, that that person standing before Jesus was doing exactly what the people who Isaiah was speaking to, they were thinking that their standing with God was based on what they had accomplished. And we know that when you talk about judgment, our only hope is Jesus. Our only hope is Jesus because Jesus took our sin on the cross. I want to read to you Isaiah 30, verses 29 and 30. It says, You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival, and gladness of heart as when one marches to the sound of the flute, to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel, and the Lord will cause His voice of authority to be heard, and the descending of His arm to be seen in fierce anger, and in the flame of a consuming fire in cloudbursts, downpour, and hailstones. I want you to notice, here again in chapter 30, we're going to get to that later on, but he's talking about when the Lord comes to reign, but he marries it with judgment. And this is a principle that we see over and over in Scripture, is that the coming of judgment has to always be, has to always be with the blessing that God brings. At the end of every life, there will be judgment. At the end of the age, the earth will be judged. But blessing and judgment are always joined. Bendición y juicio siempre se unieron. Why are blessing and judgment always joined together? Because of man's condition, we are sinful. And in order, sin, the Bible uses sickness as, as, uh, as a comparison to sin. And when you have a sickness, what needs to happen before you can really rejoice over that? It needs to be taken away. We need to be healed. We need to be restored. We need to, uh, to recover from our sickness. Sin has to be dealt with in order for there to be blessing. In order for there to be heaven, sin has to be removed. The Bible makes it very clear. And the instruction in this chapter, look at verse 22. It says, Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? In other words, man does not hold the answer to his own sin problem. In order to be forgiven, in order to be healed, in order to be restored, we must 
look to the Lord. And I just want to refer you back to verse 5. It says, Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. When Isaiah made this prophecy, he was telling us that if we experience God's forgiveness, if we walk in his light, we have something wonderful to look forward to. And so as we uh, consider for just a moment, the Bible tells us if you have put your faith in Christ, this time in which God will actually reign upon the earth is something that we actually can look forward to because we will participate in it. And so I want to refer you to some other passages. Uh, the end of the age in the Bible is something that's referred to over and over. And I meant to put a little diagram up here to represent this. But I want you to understand something. And so in your notes, if you would just write this down, under the end of the age, first of all, I want you to just put the term, this isn't on the screen. In your notes, under the end of the age, just write the rapture. The rapture. And then I want you to put a little hyphen. What is the rapture? The rapture is when Christ comes to remove his church from the world. The Bible says that if you have put your faith in Christ, there is that Jesus is going to return. I shared with you last week, 1 Thessalonians 4. Jesus is going to return. He's going to bring the spirits of those who have died with him. He's going to raise their bodies. And those who are still alive are going to be caught up to meet him in the air. He's going to remove the church from this world. After that, this is what you write next. Seven years of tribulation. Seven years of tribulation. Tribulation is T-R-I dot dot dot. <laughs> T-R-I-B-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. Put another hyphen. And put the millennial. Let's go. Let's do it this way. The thousand years. The thousand years. The millennium is a reference to a thousand years when Christ will reign. That is what Isaiah is talking about when he says, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Vayamos a la montaña del Señor. I want to read to you some other passages. Once again, this is a revelation of how this is from God because God not only spoke about this from Isaiah, God spoke about it from other, other prophets that did not know Isaiah. He, he would reveal to one man here and another man there, and he would regard, re, record bits and pieces of this revelation throughout the Bible. The book of Micah says this, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will re, be raised above the hills, and the peoples will, peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. God has promised this time of peace. God has promised this time when he will actually reign upon the earth. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 through 5 says, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of age, and the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. In the book of Revelation, John says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part 
in the first resurrection over these, the second death, has no part. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now I want you to look at the little line that you just made. The rapture, the seven years of tribulation, the millennium. Now I want you to write, make a little arrow at the rapture. And I want you to give it another title. Look at this verse again. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the, what is it called? The first resurrection. Make a little arrow pointing at the rapture and put another title, the first resurrection. The first resurrection. What the book of Revelation is saying here because God revealed a little bit at a time about what is happening in the end times, He revealed there will be a time when God will reign on the earth. He revealed in the New Testament that that time is called the millennium. It will be a thousand years and Christ will actually reign. And many people question whether the rapture will take place. Here we're actually given an order in which it happens. Blessed is he is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. <coughs> Over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is a promise that is given to the church. This is a promise it is given to those who put their faith in Christ. Judgment is coming, but those who have put their faith in Christ have no part in the second death, that spiritual death when a person is separated from God for eternity. Instead, they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Let me read it to you from another book. Paul said to Timothy, it is a trustworthy saying, statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. What Christ says is that, or what Paul says, excuse me, is that if we have trusted in Christ, we will reign with him. Now, it does. It does very much. See, this is one of those passages that people question. Does this say you can lose your salvation? I do not believe it says that you can lose your salvation, but it definitely speaks to the person who says, because I've trusted Christ, it doesn't matter what I do. The fact is, this very clearly tells us that we need to be faithful to Him. If He denies us, and I believe, if you want to take, make a note about this, and this is my understanding of Scripture as we take this with the rest of the Bible, it says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. I believe that's talking about in this life. In this life, if you are not walking with Christ, you cannot count on his protection. You cannot count on him empowering you to do what he's called you to do. If we are not walking with Christ, we forfeit the blessings of our, of our walk with Him, we cannot walk in sin and expect the blessing of God. But in terms of eternity, look at what it says next. It says, if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. I believe that's talking about salvation. Even if we fail, God's salvation is faithful because He cannot deny Himself. But to the person who says, I believe once saved, always saved, therefore it doesn't matter what I do, to that person I would say, you do not even understand salvation. You do not even understand salvation. If you have put your faith in Christ, you understand that He gave all for you. But here's what I want you to take away from this passage. If you have put your faith in Christ, you have so much to look forward to. You have not just heaven. Not just heaven. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's where you'll go once you die. If you die before Jesus comes, you, your spirit will go immediately to be with the Lord. 
We can count on that. The Bible promises that. But we're not just going to sit around on a cloud and play a harp. We're not just... People have actually said to me, I am afraid that I'll, I'll get bored in heaven. You're not going to get bored. The Bible tells us that we are actually going to reign with Christ during the millennial reign. And I want to just say to you, I may look forward to vacation, even if it's Disneyland. Here is something that we can look forward to much more than anything else this life has to offer. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This promise that is, is given in Isaiah, that God will actually establish His reign upon the earth, is something that Christians are invited to partake in. This is something that you and I, if you have trusted Christ, you will participate in the millennial reign of Christ. This is a promise given to us in God's Word. If you have not trusted Christ, you will fall under the judgment of God. And you will not experience anything but separation from God for eternity. And the Bible calls that place hell. And it's not a situation where God throws people into hell. God does everything that He can to call us to Him. He encourages us to come to Him for forgiveness. He gives us all kinds of hope to look forward to. He gives us this promise of participating with Christ in the millennial reign, but He gives us a warning of coming judgment. This is a message that comes over and over in the book of Isaiah. It's a message that comes over and over in the book called the Bible that He gave through prophet after prophet and then through apostle and apostle. And right now I'd like every person to bow their heads and I want to ask you a very important question. When judgment comes, are you prepared? When you stand before God, do you know that you have trusted Christ and that you've been forgiven for your sins? <coughs> you have two different alternatives. The coming of the reign of Christ will be something that a Christian can participate in and it's the idea of going up to the mountain of the Lord and knowing that we have a God who loves us and has accepted us because we've accepted His answer for our sinfulness. The Bible says, as many as receive Him, to them He gives the right to become the children of God, even to them that believe on His name. I want to ask you, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The Bible says... Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has told us there's all kinds of things sitting in the future. Not only heaven, but the millennial reign of Christ. But before that, the rapture in which the, the church will be removed from this world. Are you prepared? Are you prepared when Christ returns to go immediately into His presence? I want to share with you that the Bible says that you can trust Jesus right now. There's a promise in the scripture. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And I want to ask you, would you be willing to invite Jesus into your heart right now? If you would be willing, you can say this prayer. You can say it silently. You can say it out loud. You can say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I want to put my faith and my trust in you today. I open the door of my life. And I want you to come in. And I thank you for saving me. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Help me to live for you. Father, I thank you that you have given us the promise of salvation when we put our faith in Christ. I thank you that you have given us the, the knowledge of your plan for the future. That Jesus, you are going to come and establish your reign upon the earth. And you have invited us to reign with you. But first, you called us to come to you. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that if anyone today has put their faith in Christ, that they would share that with me today before they leave. Father, your word says that if we trust Jesus, we need to follow you in baptism. 
And I pray, Father, for every Christian here that we would realize that you have so much for us to look forward to. God, you have given us so much to anticipate. The idea that you would call on us to actually share in the reign of Christ. We will reign with him. Father, you have been so gracious not only to forgive us our sins, but to give us a high calling. Lord, help us to press on, to fulfill that calling in our lives, to walk in the light of the Lord day by day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.